Hello, welcome to the Warwick Globalist first experimental video special with me, Connor Woodman. For this first video, I want to address not an issue at the University of Warwick, but an issue at the University of Oxford, namely the Roads Must Fall in Oxford campaign. Roads Must Fall in Oxford is an offshoot of its namesake campaign in the University of Cape Town in South Africa. It started up this year. Its primary demand is for the removal of a statue of Cecil Rhodes at Oriel College. Cecil Rhodes was a 19th century, late 19th century British imperialist, mining magnate, uh, died one of the richest people on the planet. But Rhodes Must Fall in Oxford doesn't just want the removal of his statue, it's also a broad decolonial movement, which is uh, to say that they want to identify, confront and tear down uh, structures of institutional racism, Eurocentrism and white domination in Oxford, which has long been at the heart of the British intellectual um, colonial project. Now, that project only finished about, you know, what, five, six decades ago, formally. Before that, for hundreds of years, Britain was one of the primary movers on the global stage. So it therefore seems unlikely that that project, the beliefs which legitimated it, the structures which sustained it, seems unlikely that they would have crumbled completely in the last couple of decades. And in fact, that's the central contention of Roads Must Fall in Oxford. Namely, that the legacy of white European domination is still with us today. Um, now, I think that that central contention has been proven utterly correct by the reaction that we've had in the British mainstream media. Um, and there are two aspects of this that I want to talk about in this video today. The first one is uh, about the kind of sheer racism um, colonial apologism that we've seen out on display in the response to the Rose Must Fall campaign. I'm not just talking about the comments underneath articles or the death threats that Rose Must Fall and Oxford campaigners have been receiving, but literally the direct responses of some of our mainstream media commentators. And it goes across the political spectrum. So on the one hand, you've got people like the deranged climate denier, uh, James Dellingpool, uh, former writer of The Telegraph, who came out on the internet to remind Africans of, quote, what a complete and utter toilet their malarial continent would have been if it hadn't been for all the explorers, miners, and pioneers in the 19th century who brought civilization, the rule of law, and economic progress. Hashtag roads must rise. And then you've also got people like Nigel Bigger, writing in The Times, who said, quote, there's no doubt that Rhodes saw the British as civilised and native races as not, but he had good reason to think that. And, and in important respects, British civilization was morally superior too. Now that's in the paper of choice for the British establishment, the Times, a paper which also brought out F.W. de Klerk, the last president of apartheid, who fought his way to the top of the National Party in South Africa. They brought him out to come and condemn the campaign. So that's one side. On the other side, you've got people like Will Hutton, one of our leading left liberal intellectuals, critic of neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism, um, former editor in chief of The Observer. Uh, he came out um, in The Guardian and said, what stands between South Africa and wholly unaccountable despotism are the legacy institutions of empire, the courts, rule of law, free press, freedom of association. The legacy institutions of empire. There was no free press under the British Empire and under apartheid, which stemmed directly from British rule and incidentally was supported by the British and the Americans up until the late 1980s, there was no free press either. The only reason there's something of a free press in South Africa today is because of a decades long guerrilla struggle waged by the ANC and massive military intervention in Angola by the Cubans. And what legacy institutions is he talking about? I mean, he must be talking about the institutions that men like Cecil Rhodes laid down. Maybe he's talking about the amendment that Rhodes put forward in 1890 to the Masters and Servants Act, which reintroduced flogging for black servants. Or maybe he's talking about Rhodes' 1892 Franchise and Ballot Act, which eliminated African voting rights. I mean, Rhodes has been called the father of apartheid, and yet, according to one of our left liberal leading intellectuals, he's all that stands between South Africa and wholly unaccountable despotism. The mind boggles. The second aspect of what I want to talk about today is the sheer stupidity that's been on display and some of the arguments that commentators have been putting against the campaign. There have been a chorus of voices condemning Rhodes Must Fall for wanting to cleanse history, to quote John Simpson, who was writing in another one of our left-leading journals, The New Statesman. The point of the campaign is exactly and precisely the opposite of wanting to cleanse history. It's about recognizing the crimes of the past, and their continuing effects on the present day. 
Crimes which, let's make no mistake, are routinely downplayed and ignored in mainstream discourse. Let's take some examples in Britain. How many people in Britain are aware of the fact that the UK government was the cause of a famine in late 19th century in India which killed tens of millions of Indian peasants? How many people are aware of that one of the primary causes of problems in Iran today is the overthrow of a democratically elected government there in 1953 by the CIA and the MI6 services? People generally aren't aware of these facts and those are just two of many. And the culture which sustains this trivialising of these important crimes, the crimes that we should recognise, is symbolised precisely through things like the statue of Cecil Rhodes in Oriel College. The statue represents a silencing of his tens of thousands of black victims, whilst the person who oppressed these people is valorised and celebrated. Um, and I just want to quote something from 2003 from British historian Mark Curtis, who said, the reality of British policy is systematically suppressed. Whole episodes in Britain's history have become severely ideologically treated. What has happened is akin to the destruction of history. So to all those commentators out there, who are the ones who are cleansing history? Is it Rose Must Fall in Oxford campaigners or is it the entirety of the British establishment? The other arguments that have been levelled against the campaign similarly crumble under literally the slightest moments reflection. And the people who are making them are university educated, often Oxbridge educated. You expect them to be able to critically assess their arguments, which leads me to my conclusion that basically there are two alternative explanations for this phenomena that we've seen in this kind of media barrage. One is that the people who are putting forward these arguments that are peddling this crap really truly believe it and they can't see the fallacious nature of the arguments that they're putting forward in which case they're idiots. The other alternative is that they're well aware of the fallacious nature of their arguments, but they don't care. They just want to discredit the campaign and they're hoping that no one's paying too much attention to detail, in which case they're propagandists. These are the two options we have. Even either on the one hand, the entirety of the British media class are propagandists or they're idiots. I'll leave it to you to decide which one. Either way, roads must fall and the mainstream British media should fall with them. This has been The Warwick Globalist. Do check us out on warwickglobalist.com. I also wrote an article on this very subject. You can find it on the perspective section. We're also calling submissions for our second edition of the year on mental health. Send 250 word article proposal to submissions at warwickglobalist.com by midnight 17th of January. Uh, you can also write on other topics apart from mental health. You can write on arts and culture, politics and economics, science and technology, or for our perspective section. I've been Connor Woodman. This is The Warwick Globalist. Thanks.